Good morning. Good morning and welcome. Glad to be with you this morning and get to worship Jesus together. How amazing it is, right, that we have a Savior who's present even when we don't feel him near. You know, he's promised to be with us. Um, he said he's an ever-present help in trouble, that he's always working, that he neither slumbers nor sleeps. Um, I don't know, I just think that's a great comfort, you know? Even no matter what I am feeling, he's always worthy and he's always faithful. Uh, you know, he rejoices with us when we rejoice. He mourns with us when we mourn. And uh, yeah, it's worth praising him for that and remembering that this morning. All right, so let's uh, let's do that. First with songs, and you're welcome to, to stand if you'd like. Um, let's just go into his presence. Lord, my God, thank you so much for your nearness. Thank you that we can rest in your promises, Lord God, no matter what is happening in the world and what is happening in our own hearts, God. You've said to us that our hope is secure. That in Jesus, you are making all things new and you are saving us, Lord God, preparing us for eternity with you. You are bringing about your plan, your good, perfect, pleasing will. And that is what we pray, Lord, for, for that to be done. Lord, receive our, our songs, our words, our praises, our hearts laid bare before you, offered up to you. Restore to us joy, Lord God, in the knowledge of your salvation, in the hope you have given us, and in your great love. That we may reflect glory back to you, God, and be a light to those around us. In Jesus' name we pray. sin Jesus is calling have you come to the end of yourself do you thirst for a drink from the well Jesus is calling oh come to your regrets and mistakes come today there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling bring your sorrows and trade them for joy from the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling oh come to the altar the fire But with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Bow down before him, for he is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Savior, isn't 
As you wait for a crown, tell the world of the treasure you found. Jesus. Jesus.
from 1 Peter 1. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be re revealed in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor through Je when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible joy and glorious joy for your receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Let's take a moment and be still before God. gift of grace is Jesus my redeemer there is no more for heaven now to give he is my joy my righteousness and freedom my steadfast love my deep and boundless peace to this I hold my hope is only Jesus for my is wholly bound to his oh how strange and divine i can sing all is mine yet not i but through christ in me the night is dark but i am not forsaken for by my side the savior he will stay and rejoicing for in my need his power is displayed to this i hold my shepherd will defend me through the deepest valley he will lead oh the night has been won and i shall Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon, and he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold, my sin has been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my plea. Oh, the chains are released, I can say.
With every breath, I long to follow Jesus. For he has said that he will bring me home. And day by day, I know he will renew me. Until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. All the glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet that I love through Christ in me. To this I hold. complete still my lips shall repeat yet not i but through christ in me yet not i but through christ in me Glory be to you, Lord Jesus, our great King. Thank you, Lord, for your great love, for your presence with us, for the words and voices with which to sing to you and remember your faithfulness. Thank you, God. Be with us here in Jesus' name. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all here. Good morning to those who are watching online. Um, can't see you, but we know you're there. Um, <laughs> this morning, we're going to look at John chapter 7. So if your Bibles, go ahead and turn to John chapter 7. The title of my sermon this morning is simply Living Water. Living Water. Now, living water is not necessarily a term that we use very often, but living water refers to activity. So when you are out and about in the wilderness, like I'm sure many of you are, <laughs> on a regular basis. Living water is the water that's coming down the stream, or it's water that's coming out of a spring. It's living, it's moving. Water that's not living is water that's been collected into a pool. It's stagnant. And so when you have living water, it's something that you can drink. It's something that you can trust more than you can trust, uh, trust stagnant water. And so when it comes to John chapter 7, and what, what we experience when we meet Jesus is that Jesus talks about being living water and about how we can draw from him, how we, how we can come to him. And in this passage, he actually says that if people come to him, believe in him, he will make them living water. Make them living water. He will make them people who are refreshing, people who will bring life to wherever they may be. Now, in thinking of this, we will look here at uh, the, first, the first few chapters. So the way that I've split this up this morning is that um, there's three points. The first is, in verses 1 through 5, my time has not yet come. And then the second part is 6 through, I believe, about 20. And that is righteous anger. That sounds like a good point, right? And then lastly is let anyone who is thirsty. 
So my time has not yet come. Righteous anger, and let anyone who is thirsty come. So let's look here at the first five verses of chapter 7. It says this, After this, Jesus went around in Galilee, purposely staying away from Judea, because the Jews there were waiting to take his life. But when the Jewish fest- feast of tabernacles was near, Jesus' brothers said to him, You ought to leave here and go to Judea so that your disciples may see the miracles you do. No one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. For even his own brothers did not believe in him. Now, in these first five verses, we see Jesus in a different place. We see him with his family, with his brothers. Now, just before, in chapter 6, Jesus had quite the following. He had fed, he had fed the 5,000, and which is a lot of people, because uh, it wasn't just 5,000, it was 5,000 men. So there was thousands of people who were following Jesus. And then through a series of events... Not only did the people leave, but then also his disciples, many of his disciples left him because of his teaching. And so we find Jesus at home with his brothers, and his brothers are trying to console him because they can see that perhaps things are not going as well as, as, they, as he would like. And so they say to him, they call him a public figure. Isn't that interesting? In verse 4, no one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. And so they just are saying to Jesus, how about you just go out and do your thing? You know how you fed all those people? That was pretty cool. I mean, you got lots of folks to come. I mean, a lot of people have left, but it's all right. Just do one more of those miracle things that you did before and, and uh, show yourself to the world. And then, uh, and then everything will be fine. And what's interesting is that in verse 5, it says that even his brothers, his own brothers, did not believe in him. Now, what an interesting verse that is, because they just told him, listen, we know that you can do miracles, you can do all this stuff, so how about you go and do that? So exactly what are they believing in? If they don't believe in him, what are they believing in? And I think it has more to do with the purpose of who Jesus was and is. You see, for Jesus, he was not here to simply gather a crowd or gain notoriety as a miracle worker. His purpose was greater and far beyond anyone could imagine, because he was the Messiah. He was the chosen one. He was the one who had come to save the world. And so they say to him, from their own understanding, how about you just go out and get some more people? But Jesus says to them, in the verses after, Verse 7 specifically, it says, The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that what it does is evil. Now, in testifying that what the world does is evil, Jesus is coming to speak the truth, but then also to be the solution for that situation. His brothers were trying to help him regain some popularity because so many abandoned him in chapter 6. But the reality was is that everyone, everyone was going to abandon him because of his obedience to God the Father. The obedience, this obedience though would gain far more than any notoriety or following ever could. There's a quote from a, com, uh, from a scholar that I was reading this week. Rodney Whitaker, it says this, Jesus' aim is not to gain a following, but to reveal his Father by being faithful and obedient to him. Jesus' aim is not to gain a following, but to reveal his Father by being faithful and obedient to him. One of the things that's happening this year, and I, you know, I talk about our orange tree from time to time, but our oranges are, are bright orange now. And uh, we've enjoyed several of them, and we were able to hold off the kids from shaking all the flowers off in the spring, so we actually have quite a few. But the thing is, that's amazing about the oranges, you know, we could eat an orange, um, like we could go buy an orange and bring it to our house and eat it, and then, you know, I shouldn't be surprised that after eating all those oranges, if we didn't have an orange tree, I shouldn't be surprised that there aren't any more oranges. And see, the chasing of fame or the chasing of notoriety is simply a passing fruit or opportunity. It's just one piece. It's not the source. And so what Jesus was doing and accomplished through his death was to plant a seed 
of the gospel and literally plant himself in the earth so that there might be boundless fruit for you and I to enjoy and share with others. Jesus' obedience cost him everything, yet it accomplished far more than the sacrifice. Jesus was not interested in being a public figure, only to make known publicly the love and mercy of God. The love and mercy of God. So when we think about Jesus, I think there are times that we can be concerned about popularity and those kinds of things, but Jesus did not come to be popular, and that's not what we're called to be either. Rather, we're called to be faithful and obedient to God. Faithful and obedient to God. Now, righteous anger. Here is the piece that um, we see this. When Jesus begins to talk to the Jews, so he tells his brothers to go to the festival of booths, Sukkot. It's a festival in the fall, and it's it was one of the gathering festivals, so they would, they would gather three times a year in Jerusalem, and this was one of the times that they would do that. And So he tells his brothers to go, and so they go, but then Jesus follows later, not publicly, he just goes privately. And one of the things that was being said about Jesus was how he was being treated by the leadership, by the Jewish leadership, and how there was a lot of people who were not happy with him, and how they were out really to kill him. And what's interesting is that when we think about this anger, this righteous anger, why do we get angry? Very simply, the reason why we get angry is that our expectations are not met, and we, resent, we respond with an emotion. Um, having four boys, we see a lot of anger throughout the day, right? Uh, <laughs> Actually, it's really cute. It's not supposed to be cute, but uh, Isaac and Hosea have begun to express that with words. You know, I'm so angry. You know, they say it in their little two-year-old slurred whatever, uh, but it's coming through, you know. <laughs> but we get angry because our expectations are not met, and we get frustrated. That's our response. And so the question is, is it wrong to be angry? And the answer is no, it's not wrong to be angry. It's not wrong to have anger. Even God is described as being angry. When things to be going, seem to be going well in life, it's hard to relate to those who are angry, isn't it? When we've had a good day and we go home and people in our family are upset, it's a little bit of a shock, isn't it? Because you didn't have the same experience that they did. And so it's hard to relate at times when life seems to be going well with those who are angry. When things begin to fall apart, it's easier to understand why anger exists. Now, the thing with anger is that anger can blind us. There's something that happens when we get angry, and if we let anger get out of control or overtake us, then it can blind us to what's going on around us. It can, it can cause us to do things or say things or act in a way that later we think, that probably wasn't the best thing that I should have said. We come to our senses, right? We often say that when we are coming out of our anger. I've come to my senses and realized that what I said or what I did was not right. Now with Jesus and the Jews, Jesus was, was upsetting their expectations. In John 7 verse 25 it says this, at that point, some of the people of Jerusalem began to ask, isn't this the man they are trying to kill? Which is funny because just a few verses earlier, Jesus gets up and says, why are you trying to kill me? And they said, who is trying to kill you? And then a few verses later, they say, hey, isn't this the guy they're trying to kill? <laughs> Seemed to be some confusion uh, <laughs> amongst all of this stuff. But the reason why they're trying to kill him is because he healed a guy on the Sabbath, on the Sabbath, when there was supposed to be no work done, he healed a guy. And for them, what the who Jesus was, was someone that they did not expect. I can even say that today. I think when we look at Jesus, when we really look at the life of Christ, and we think about who Jesus was and is, he's not really who we expect him to be. Everything is kind of turned on its head. 
Here's, here's the God of the universe who's come down, not as a king, not as someone who's rich and powerful, not as someone who has a lot of influence, but as a baby born in a barn, born in a manger. And then we see that he lives a humble life, and people don't even give him credit. One of his own disciples says, is there anything that could, that good that could come out of Nazareth, which is his hometown? Which is like somebody saying to us, is there anything good that can come out of Tucson? Well, yeah, Sonoran hot dogs. Have you ever been here? Eegees, come on down and try it. <laughs> but the reality is, is that with Jesus, there's so much that's turned upside down. Right, he breaks the rules, but yet by breaking the rules, he's fulfilling the law of God. And the, what are the rules that he's breaking? Well, he's breaking rules that were really set up by men to protect, protect what was holy. But people had forgotten that. And so they get angry. And they're trying to get rid of him. They're trying to purify themselves. But what they don't realize is that Jesus is actually there to purify them. That's what Jesus has come to do. He's come to reveal the heart of God, to fulfill the law. You see, because one of the things that is true about people, about us, is that we're finicky. And when it comes to God and the way that he moves and the way that he works, and we've seen it throughout the Old Testament, is that people can have experiences with God. And yet their faithfulness to him, their belief in him, their trust in him can sometimes change within a day, within a couple of years, and oftentimes with a generation. Second Chronicles 24, 17 through 19 says this, Jehoiada was a king who was a good king, who loved God. It said, after the death of Jehoiada, the officials of Judah came and paid homage to the king, and he listened to them. They abandoned the temple of the Lord, the God of their ancestors, and worshipped Asherah poles and idols. Because of their guilt, God's anger came on Judah and Jerusalem, although the Lord sent prophets to the people to bring them back to him. And though they testified against them, they would not listen. So the anger of God. So we think about the anger that's being shown here by the people of God, by the Jews here, by the leaders, and how the, Jesus is kind of upsetting the situation. And we think, well, why would, should these people be angry? But then we think, well, the reason why we're angry is because our expectations are not met. People are not playing by our rules. And so for them, their response is to take life, is to destroy, to purify in that sense. But rather with Jesus, he's coming not to destroy life, but to give life. See, because God is angry. We don't talk about the wrath of God. I don't talk about the wrath of God very often. Mostly because I feel like that there's a lot of fear when it comes to church and when it comes to religion and when it comes to God. Not just fear in our church, but fear personally. There's fear that sometimes when I speak to God, when I approach God, that I won't be worthy, that I won't be found worthy. And that if I, if I approach him in the wrong way or with the wrong words or with the wrong attitude, that something bad will happen to me. I think that that's where a lot of us are at times. When we talk about the wrath of God, when we talk about the fear of God and the anger of God. And we can also relate to people who have talked about the wrath of God in a way that's not good. That puts fear in us that's more about manipulation and control of us rather than helping us to see God for who he is. And so if we think about expectations and we think about who God is, if God really is the one who created everything and put everything into place and made it the way it's supposed to be, his expectations of us then are the highest expectations. And so then when we don't meet those expecta expectations, then he has every right to be upset, to be angry. And there's a couple of good things about that. One is that this shows us that anger is not bad. Anger in and of itself is not wrong. There are times that we whitewash our emotions or we whitewash our 
our concerns and our fears. We hide what's really going on inside because we're afraid that we won't be found worthy. But when it comes to anger, God does not hold back. God shows his wrath. He says, I'm angry. Now, what does anger do then? What is that responsible for? Because I think sometimes we can say, well, I was angry and then I made a mistake. It wasn't that the anger was the problem. Rather, it was the choices that we made while we were angry that's the mistake. So anger in and of itself is not wrong. Just like money in and of itself is not wrong. That's what we do with it. That's how we use it. That reflects our character. And so when we think about the wrath of God and we think about the anger of God, what did God do? Did he wipe us out? No. Romans 5, 8 through 11 says this, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. So here we see something that God did. God recognized his wrath. God was not, he did not hide that. But what he did in the midst of his anger showed his character, displayed his character for us. His love for us. And so we see here that anger for breaking the rules, anger that came up here in this passage in John 7, and then anger of God, and the, even the anger that comes up in our own lives comes up for when people break the rules and we feel like they're disrespecting, especially when it comes to the church or when it comes to Jesus, all that is holy. When we, when we feel like people do that, then we become angry, become frustrated at the very least. But here, there are three things about anger. The first is that anger does not bring about the righteousness of God. James 1, 19 through 20 says this, My dear brothers and sisters, Take note of this, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. There is something false about anger, and that is, is that we feel powerful when we're angry. There's a rush of strength, there's a boldness, there's a fixated mark that we have when we become angry. But the reality is, is that anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. We can become angry, we can be angry, but then in our anger, we must not believe that that is what brings about the right living, the righteousness that God desires for us. In Ephesians 4, 26 through 27, it says, In your anger do not sin, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Ephesians 4, 26 through 27. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. There's something about anger that allows Satan to come in. That allows there to be a place for, sa for Satan to stand in our lives. Because we kind of lose our wits. We lose our common sense. We lose kind of the thinking process that we would normally go through when we're angry. And so it says here, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Don't sin in your anger. Because sin is crouching at your door. This is what Genesis 4, 7, it says, If you do what is right, you will, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, and you must rule over it. This is what God said to Cain. This is what God said to Cain. 
right? Cain and Abel presented offerings to God. God accepted Abel's and rejected Cain's, and Cain was angry. He was disappointed. God said to him, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? If you do what is not right, if you don't do what's right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you. You must rule over it. The thing that is true about sin and really about idolatry is that it promises more than it could ever give and it costs more than we could ever imagine. It promises more than it could ever give and it costs more than it could, we could ever imagine. Sin and idolatry, anger at times. We can put it in a place believing that it will give us more than it could ever give and what ends up happening is it costs us more than we could ever imagine. So here's the challenge that we have when it comes to anger, when it comes to living our lives. And it's a challenge that the Jews faced. And as the challenge of laying our expectations and anger down, when we do that, we give up the right to avenge. We give up the right to make things just, to, to put things back in place. When we lay our expectations down, when we lay our anger down, we become in many ways, helpless. One of the things that we tell our boys when they're fighting, it rarely works, but we tell them this anyways. <laughs> when our boys are fighting with one another, we often tell them instead of escalating or winning the fight, because they're at this place now in their lives where they're going to win, right? I'm going to win. I'm going to get really big. I'm going to get really loud. And we say to them, don't try to win the fight. Just come get us for help, and we'll help you sort it out. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> but the reason is that they are not able to resolve it without going too far. They're, they'll resolve it, sure, but usually ends up with someone in tears, someone that makes the situation worse, and it takes a, a hard situation and makes it even harder. So when it comes to anger, when it comes to our expectations not being met, and we lay them down, the reason why we lay them down is because oftentimes when we try to resolve it in our anger, we end up going too far. We end up going too far. And it's okay to lay it down. Trust that God is the opposite of sin in the sense that God can do more than we could ever imagine with what we give him. He could do more than we could ever imagine in ways we never thought possible. When we lay and surrender our lives before him, when we surrender situations before him. Jesus was not what anyone expected, and they had hoped for a national leader that would free them from the Roman occupation and restore their country. That was what the Jewish people at this time longed for, they longed for a leader who would free them, who would throw off the Roman occupation. And they missed something crucial, and that is God's reign in their lives. They missed that peace. They had oversimplified it and decided that the way forward was actually a restoration of what was. They had said, this is what God is going to do. He's going to restore us to like we were. And that's going to be so glorious. And they had all these expectations. But see, the problem is, is that the expectation of faith by itself, by nature, is that we know God will carry out his plan of restoration, yet the final look and feel of it is his decision, not ours, because he's the one who's in charge. The piece that is most important is him. When it comes to our faith, when it comes to our lives, the most important thing is him, not an idea or not a dream, but rather it's God. Because how can we be in the kingdom of God if God is not our king? If we begin to dictate how things will be, if we begin to put out expectations about what this will look like, and we do it aside from God, if we don't hold it loosely, then how can we really be in the kingdom of God if God is not our king? If God is king, then he will have the final say, will he not? 
if we obey our own authority or someone else, someone else's authority, are we really yielding to God? God is our king. And the challenge in that is that it's not easy to give up. It's not easy to give up our authority because God has given us authority. By saying this, I'm not saying that we should never make any decisions ever again for our lives because that's foolish. What I'm saying here is that there is, there is a line where we need to understand that God's work and God's moving forward, the big things, that God's kingdom coming, those kinds of things, as much as we want it to look a certain way, as much as we look back and think that's the way it has been, that's the way it's always been, and that's the way it's going to be in the future, that's difficult. That's a difficult thing for us to do because what we end up doing is holding on to the past and fighting for something that's gone by instead of recognizing God with us. That God endures all things. That he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that just like Jesus, our aim is to reflect the Father through our obedience and faithfulness. It's to, repl- it's to reflect who God is. Ethan Hawke wrote a book called Rules for a Night. And um, I've been thinking about our kids and how to how to train them up in a way that they should go. And one of the rules was that it's about courage. And it says, anything that gives light must endure burning. (laughs) It must endure burning. It must endure the challenge. We are called to be the light of the world. There are certainly many blessings in following God, but at the same time, the truth is, is that we follow a crucified Savior. We follow a Savior who was humble, who wasn't always the most popular for the right reasons, but rather he was honored because he was obedient to what God had called him to do. The second, the last point here this morning, let anyone who is thirsty. So Sukkot, the festival of booths, I already said it happens in the fall and it's a week long. It celebrates God's miraculous work work to free the Israelites from Egypt. In fact, it's still happening today. The, the um, festival of Sukkot will happen in 2021, September 20th through the 27th of this fall. And so it's still an ongoing tradition that, uh, that the Jewish folks today celebrate. But during the time of the temple, they had a, uh, what they called a libation ceremony where they would come out and they would pour water. The priests would come out and pour water on the ground as an offering To God, and in verse 37 and 38 of chapter 7 here, this is happening. On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. So Jesus stands up and declares, after this is They've gone through this whole week of pouring water, and there's this whole rem- remind- remembering what happened when, when the exodus took place and how God freed those folks from, from the Egyptian um, control. And one of the things that happens is that in the desert, God provides for the Israelites. So Exodus 17, 5 through 7, Moses goes in to, to get some water. And so what this is what happens. It says, The Lord answered Moses, Go out in front of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will stand there before you by the rock of Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel and he called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Isn't it interesting that, that Jesus is a person who's bringing up this discussion? Is this the Messiah? We don't know. Who is this guy? There's lots of questions that happen in this chapter, chapter 7. They're not sure who Jesus is. And so here Jesus stands up and says, Come to me. Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. 
Jesus is declaring that he is the source of living water. He's the source of living water. And not just him, but then he, he makes it possible for others to become a source of living water. So he, he says, to come to me and drink, and then I will make in you rivers of living water to flow from within them. He will make people a place of refreshment and restoration, a people who bring healing and hope and life. So this week, we were all probably aware of what happened on January 6th. There was a rally in Washington that we've all heard about, and the most disturbing part, besides the violence, were the signs that associated Trump and the actions of the rioters who broke into the Capitol with Jesus. This Jesus... This Jesus that we have come to worship this morning is not one who rode into Jerusalem with armies and overcame the Romans by force. He was one that surrendered his life to the Father's, to the Father's will completely. He did not draw blood or take anything by force. Rather, he allowed himself to be accused, beaten, ridiculed, and crucified. For some of us, we understand this and struggle with the events of this week. For others of us, we cannot believe that those who were a part of this were, were anything more than actors. And for still others, we believe the protesters, protesters were real and that there are people who have wrongly placed too much faith in government, and more specifically in Trump. Now, I don't talk about politics from up here for one very good reason, and that is we're not here to push any kind of political agenda. We're here to talk about Jesus. But it's difficult when we see Christ put forward with something that is so, so much against what Scripture says about Jesus. And I know that for us who are a part of this church, we're splintered. We're struggling. So how could we possibly be united? Well, it just so happens that on a Wednesday afternoon, I met a grandma and her two grandsons here at the church building. The two boys were six and seven, and besides my own kids, they were probably two of the cutest kids I've seen all week. I think they were missing teeth. You know, like you get the cute kids that are kind of chubby and they're missing teeth, and they were so excited to be here because they were here to pick up a bunk bed. They were here to pick up something that they'd been looking forward to because they were sleeping in a small room. They're there because their family isn't safe. So they're with their grandma. Now this bunk bed was, is, was and has given them a chance to have more space, to have something they can celebrate in their lives as they've struggled over the last few months to figure out what's going on. It's something that's just for them. And at that age, who doesn't love a bunk bed, right? Even today, I kind of get excited about bunk beds. If I could, I might sleep in a bunk bed. But I don't. So <laughs> but that bed came from us. That didn't come from me. That came from us. That came from our church. That came from all of us. Now, I had the privilege of loading this bed into the back of this grandma's truck. And I personally got to see the gratitude from this grandma 
I don't know how many times she said thank you to me. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're welcome, you're welcome, you're welcome. I felt like I was kind of in a cycle. Thank you, you're welcome, thank you, you're welcome. (laughs) I was back and forth. The boys, you know, they were smiley and giggly the whole time. And I just said, hey, can I pray with you? And they said, oh, yes. We pray all the time, don't we, boys? I said, oh, yeah. And so I got to pray with them and for them. And I blessed the bunk beds. I don't think that's a really Quaker thing to do, but I did it. So, <laughs> But I blessed it. I, I prayed for it. I prayed for them. I prayed for the situation. And they blessed me as they left because I could, not t- I could tell that we had truly made a difference in their lives. That all of us had made a difference in their lives. I got to be the spokesperson. I got to be the one who did that. But it was because of you all. It was because of us that made that possible. And so how do we handle everything that's going on in our country How do we handle the pandemic? How do we handle all this stuff? Well, this is how we handle it. The best way to dispel fear, anxiety, hatred, and the like, to push back the darkness like a single candle in a dark room, is to take up the way of Christ. It's to literally be like Jesus, to be committed to Reflecting the Father's love and mercy and grace to those around us. To do the work of believing in Jesus, believing in him, as it says in John 6, 29. To believing that Jesus is Lord of lords and King of kings, regardless of what's going on around us. To do the work of loving like him. For all of us have a place where we can serve where we can make it brighter, where we can bring hope. Not all of us get to give grandma's bunk beds. <laughs> you certainly can. If you want to come with me, we're actually going to go take some beds this afternoon to another, to another mom. But if you can't be here, if whatever's going on because of the situation with the pandemic or whatever's going on, if you can't be here to be a part of that, there is something that God has given you to do. And you have the opportunity, wherever you are, To make that place brighter, to bring hope, not through your own strength, but by believing and trusting in Jesus Christ and living like him, loving like him. To do the work of sacrificing like him for the sake of revealing the good news, declaring the good news, preaching the good news that Jesus Christ is Lord and that there is no one else who deserves our worship or our praise, or our hope, or our hearts. For in him alone do we find living water. For every knee will bow at the name of Jesus, and every tongue confess that he is Lord, and that he is King. So where does that leave us? That leaves us with this. It's okay for us to be angry. It's okay for us to be frustrated. It's okay for us to feel disappointed. Yet in our anger, our frustration, and our disappointment, let us not sin, but rather let us declare the goodness of God. The love of God. Because in John 3.16, it says that God so loved the world that he gave. And love is not easy. It's a choice. It's a decision that we make. And sometimes it's hurtful, sometimes it's hard, sometimes it's painful to love other people when we don't want to. But that's what we're called to do as Christians. John 13, 35 says that they will know you are my disciples when you love one another. By your love for one another. Galatians 6, 7 through 10 says this, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. So 
So moving forward, let us commit ourselves to the way of Christ, to the way of Jesus. Many of you may or may not know that January 6th was also Epiphany for the Western Catholic Church and Theophany for the Eastern Orthodox Church. Epiphany celebrates the Magi coming to Christ and therefore the revelation of God to the Gentiles. Theophany celebrates the baptism of Jesus and the dual nature of Christ who is both fully man and fully God. If there was ever a day to realize that so much of what we find security in is not eternal, it would... It, <laughs> this, it, sorry. If there was ever a day to realize that there's so much of what we find security in is not eternal... It was on that day. If there was ever a day to realize that Jesus understands the struggle that we all face with injustice, being torn between what we do and navigating dangerous waters, what a glorious day for it to be. January 6th was a difficult day. My hope and my prayer is that those days are few, that we don't have that many days ahead of us like we did on the 6th, that this kind of increasing tension that we feel in our country and even in our church at times. But that begins to subside. That's my prayer. But more than just prayer for relief, my prayer is that we will follow God, that we will follow Christ, that we will commit our ways to him, and that we will reflect his goodness, and his love to those around us. Corey Ten Boom um, has a great quote from the Kairos Journal. I hope you all have enjoyed the Kairos Journal, for those of you who have been doing it, but she has a quote that was listed in there. It says, is prayer your steering wheel or your spare tire? My hope is that prayer, meeting with God, will be our steering wheel moving forward. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. God, we thank you for your love for us. Father, what a week this has been and what a time we find ourselves in. God, we ask that you would meet us here in this place. God, we ask that you would meet us wherever we may be. Father, may we be united in one thing, and that is you. Give us wisdom, Father, moving forward and knowing how to, to walk and talk with people, to how to serve people, how to love people, God, that we don't agree with or we may not see eye to eye with, Father. God, we pray for, for peace for our nation. God, we pray for our leaders. God, we pray for the church. We pray for our friends, family of churches, God. God, we pray for our community here in Tucson and for our little church, God. We, we ask that you would guide us, Father, that you would purify us, Father, that we would put you first, Father, that you would walk with us and that we would find hope in you. And we thank you, God. We thank you and we praise you for who you are and for your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to invite you to do a couple of things right now. The first is that if you are new with us, you can text CONNECT to the, the number that's on the screen. And uh, we can get you connected to the events that are happening here at the church. The second is I want to invite you to give back this morning in an act of worship um, through tithes and offerings. And you can do that a couple of ways. If you're here in person, there's a black box on, this, on the wall. And if you're watching online, there's a give button that, that has a link where you can go online and give that way. But let's continue our worship together this morning by singing some hymns together. In John 14, 15, Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will speak and I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives in you and will be with you. A, a chapter later, Jesus says, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Christ calls us to submit ourselves to him in love and to show his love to those around us. 
The reality of Christ's life and death is a refusal of worldly power. The reality of Christ's resurrection is the promise that God's spirit lives in us. It enables us to live out reconciliation, the making right of all things that only Christ can make possible. I pray for our church, for our denomination, for the church across the United States, that we would turn to these realities of our faith and that we would humbly submit ourselves to following Christ. Both of the hymns that we'll sing this morning are variants on versions in our hymnal, but they use tunes that I think you'll find familiar and the words will be on the screen. The first are words written by Margaret Clarkson that you can find on pages 310 and 311 in our hymnal, but we'll sing them to the tune used generally with Be Still My Soul. Clarkson's words are a reflection on a verse from John 20, when Jesus commissions his disciples to do his work in the world, just as the Father has sent Jesus. So we'll sing three verses. So send I you to find the bruised and broken, or wandering souls to work, to weave, to wake, to bear the burdens of a world weary. So send I you to suffer for my sake. So send I you my strength to know in weakness, my joy in grief, my perfect peace in pain. To prove my power, my grace, my promised presence, so send I you eternal fruit to gain. So send I you in sorrow yet rejoicing as poor in store yet boundless wealth to give. As having not and yet possess Sing all things, so send I you the life of health to live. Amen. May we live that life. The second hymn that we'll close with uses the tune we know from Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, and it uses this uses it with words that praise and adore Christ as the one who frees us and leads us into his work. You'll hear a line about a piercing two-edged sword, and that's a reference to Revelation where we see Christ's ability alone to judge and to make things right. The final line also is to praise the one who makes us one. And it's my prayer this morning that we would love and encourage one another in doing God's work. So there are three verses of this one called Praise the One Who Breaks the Darkness. Mm -hmm. Praise the one who breaks the darkness with the liberating light. Praise the one who frees the prisoners, turning blindness into sight. Praise the one who preached the gospel, healing every dread disease calming storms and feeding thousands with the very bread of peace. Praise the one who blessed the children with the strong yet gentle word. Praise the one who drove out demons with the piercing two-edged sword. Praise the one who brings cool water to the desert's burning sand. From this well comes living water, quenching thirst in every land. Praise the one true love incarnate, 
Christ who suffered in our place. Jesus died and rose for many, that we may know God by grace. Let us sing for joy and gladness, seeing what our God has done. Praise the one redeeming glory, praise the one who makes us one. Let us sing for joy and gladness, seeing what our God has done. Praise the one redeeming glory, praise the one who makes us one. Almighty God, we come before you humbled. We come before you reveling in your worth, your worth to be worshipped, your gentleness, your willingness to give yourself up, the new life that you have called us to through your resurrection. Christ, we pray earnestly that you would be in us and working through us. I pray that you would be working in this church, that you would be working in your church across our country, I pray always that you would be working in your church around the world, that we would worship nothing but you, that we would follow you with our lives, and that we would be humble and loving in all that we do. God, I pray for our country, specifically that you would give wisdom and strength to leaders to help them make good decisions that will be for the benefit of all people. God, I pray for healing. I pray for a way forward in this time. I pray that you would bring peace that you would help us to have hard conversations, that you would help your church to love the world in your name. Christ, I pray that you would empower us in all these things. I pray for your healing. I pray that we could come before you now and through this whole week in worship. In Jesus' name, I pray these things. Amen. Amen. Let's continue to pray together. Heavenly Father, we want to lift up to you this morning. Gina, God, we thank you that she uh, has a new job starting this week, and we just pray, God, for continued protection for her, God, as she serves our community and those who are sick. Father, we also just want to lift up all the other health care healthcare workers in our community, Father, who are working many hours, and um, God, we just pray that you would keep them safe. Father, we um, we thank you for the way that they're, they're serving and working. Um, God, we also want to lift up to you this morning, too, Juanita and her daughter, Emily. Father, we thank you for them and pray that you would be with Emily as she um, and her family as they settle in in Tennessee. Um, God, we pray that you'd be with Juanita as well, God, that you would meet her in just the right way, at just the right time, God, um, as this transition continues. Um, Father, we also uh, thank you for Jim's knee replacement, God, that it was it went well and that he's doing well. Pray, God, for, for both him and Pam, God, as they uh, work through this time of recovery for Jim, and we just pray for good things for him in the future. Um, God, we thank you for Mark and Denise and that they're here in Tucson. God, we pray that you would um, help them as they settle in. God, that you would keep them uh, healthy and safe. And we just thank you so much, God, as they're here, um, but pray that you'd be with them as they settle in. Father, we also want to lift up to you this morning, Lindsay. God, we thank you for her and just pray that you would be with her as she um, tries to decide what to do with her job. And um, God, we just pray, God, for wisdom for her, um, that you would make it clear to her what it is that she needs to do. Um, God, we lift up these requests and any other requests, God, that are unspoken this morning. Um, God, and we, we put them in your hands, knowing that you are Lord and King and that you rule and reign. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, as far as this week goes, um, there's a Bible study at Cliff's House on Tuesday night at 630, and then uh, Thursday morning, the breakfast at 7, and then... Um, I believe that the women's Bible study will begin again this week at 9 a.m. Um, on Wednesday morning. It's a Zoom Bible study, so if you're interested in being a part of that, you can do that remotely, um, and just let me know, and I can get you the, you can either text that number that was on the screen, or you can, if you're here in person, we'll, we'll get you the information that you need to be a part of that. Um, and then just coming up, not this week, but the following week, we're going to start our midweek, uh, another Zoom Bible study on Wednesday night, uh, going over the book of James. And so if you're interested in that, um, I invite you to, to let me know, and, and we'd love to get you plugged into that as well. So um, I think that's, oh, and then, sorry, January 17th, so not, so today's the 10th, right? Yeah, so the 17th, we're going to have our 
uh, annual business meeting as a church. And so what that entails is we'll look at some of the business items as far as the budget, kind of some plans for the year. And so and just spend some time talking about 2021. We're going to do that in a hybrid, kind of like we do right now, where we have some, you're welcome to come if you want to be in person, but then we'll also live stream it. And we'll have a way for you to communicate if you have questions or if you want to add to the discussion, you can do that through the chat if you're watching online. So yes, Cliff. Yeah, you bet. So Carrie and Joy, is that right? So Cliff was just saying that his brother Carrie and his wife Joy um, are sending their thanks for our prayers as they've recovered from throat surgery, both of them. And so, um, yeah. As far as the business meeting, it'll be at 4 o'clock um, next Sunday, hybrid model. Um, so thank you so much for coming this morning. Let's go ahead and stand, and we'll uh, stand, say our benediction together. Therefore... I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Amen.